Hey Siri, translate to French Canadian. Welcome to Boxes to Builds, Volume 7. In French, Canadian Welcome to Boxes to Builds, Volume 7 is Les Canadiens accueillent des boîtes pour construire le volume 7. There you go. <laughs> Welcome, Boxes to Builds, Volume 7. Hey, I had to throw that one in there. This set is going to Quebec, Canada. Let's see what we got. Okay, as you can see, I already opened up the boxes and because there was two of them and they were really quite heavy. And we have the, uh, we have an older version of the Titleist uh, T100s. This is like a circa 2019-ish, right? And there's one right there. This is the pitching wedge. And all these, when these first came out, they were to be low to almost no offset irons, very low, uh, very small top lines. Just, I mean, this was a serious player's club. And they had very small soles on them. So they were a, obviously they're a forge club, I believe. Small cavities, small top lines, small offsets, if none. And it's certainly for a player. We're also adding in a Titleist H1 Hybrid, uh, 19 degree. This has what they call a active recoil channel and a weight that goes right here on the, on the front. And that's to help you with turning the club over or not. We're also putting in, uh, we're also shafting up an M6 TaylorMade. All right, this is a five wood. This one's gonna be kind of interesting. I've been playing with it already and it's not fitting. So we'll see how that one goes. And then last but not least, a ping, 425, but this one's the max, right? Last one I showed you was an LST. Now, what's the difference here? A max has, if you look at it from a playing position, it sets a little bit close. That's what it's kind of for. Still has the weight like we sh on the previous one. See that weight right there? And you can go into, you can move it from side to side just ever so slightly. So it must be a significant amount of weight. We'll see about that. All right, and then we have one last, this is kind of unique. It's a ping 425 four iron. I guess we're gonna kind of use this as utility maybe, and we'll go from there. Now, what are we putting in them? This is where it's gonna get tricky. And this is gonna be the topic. I've already figured it out. What we're putting in is dynamic gold S300s, okay? S300. Now he's already, and there's going to be two topics, I think. He's already sent them to where they've been pured. See that line that's on there? That's a puring line. We're going to see where they land with that. The other one is, is that he has sent me parallel tips. Titleist is infamous for taper tips. So we're going to make parallel tips fit into taper tips. There's a topic. Along with that, because he's pretty adept at this kind of stuff, is the frequency, the flex. And we're really gonna do a hard, we're really gonna concentrate on the flex, all right, the flex or the frequency of these irons. Because that was, there's a, he's given me a lot of paperwork, and I'll show you. He's given me a lot of paperwork on specs. And he's given me a lot of paperwork on slopes, which are, these are frequencies and then on the slopes. Now I've kind of married them up to what I've got on my chart. And so what we're looking at is something in between the middle of the stiff to the top of the stiff range for irons, and then basically out of sight for the wood section of it. And he says that in here. So that's gonna be interesting enough. So it's gonna be making them fit, getting them frequency matched. Now he, he does he does specify a swing weight, which I think will be made of unobtainium. We'll see. Why do I say that? Well, I tried looking for a spec, and when using a standard shaft, which this is, and they normally the title of stuff was between a D2, D3 ish kind of thing. And that's a standard length. He wants a half inch over. That's three extra swing weight points and he's putting on a grip that's standard in weight, which is the, <coughs> which is Tacky Mac, all right? The Tacky Mac grip. 
And this one's got a kind of a neat little, uh, it's called the IT2 or IT2. And a very, sti very sticky, just like Tachymac known for. And it seems to be a firmer rubber grip, so that's also another positive. And we're going to put two extra rolls of tape on or underneath of it, which is also going to add. So he's wanting a lighter swing weight. I don't see that happening without back weighting because I am not removing, I'm not removing chrome from these really nice looking clubs. So that's going to be the, that's going to be the we'll we'll discuss this as we're making it. But anyway, I wanted to show you the topic. I wanted to show you this. And so for those of you that might be in Quebec and you do speak French, YouTube allows me to subtitle this and I'm going to try and put uh, the French Canadian across the bottom and allows you to make changes if the if YouTube does not understand. So, you know, feel free. And again, so let's get started. Welcome to Boxes of Bills number seven and let's get motoring. So we ream the heads in order for them to be able to uh, accept the 370 shafts. Now the questions are, what size do I ream it to? Well typically what I like to do is no more than one tenth over the size. So if your tip size was 370, then 380 is what we're looking for. As it turns out, 380 is basically 3 eighths of an inch. Now, I wouldn't mind doing 379 just to make it a little tighter. They do make them, but if you get into these oddball sizes, that it tends to increase pricing because they're just not readily made. Now, why do I choose to ream instead of drill, right? This is where it comes into. Well, if you look at the top of this guy, right, see that? It's flat. Whereas if I have a drill, now this is bigger obviously, but it makes the point. See that guy? There's a, there's a point. There's a point. So basically what you're doing is you're unnecessarily taking more metal. Where this guy doesn't. So you're taking all the minimum amount, it's creating a flat bottom for the shaft to seat. Where this guy, I mean it'll still seat, but then you have all that extra room that you just remove metal for for no apparent reason. From a machinist point of view, and I'm not one, uh, it's a little easier to remove. It's the finish inside the hosel is better. All these little different things. So the reamer is the way to go. Now I get mine from MSC. Uh, there's plenty to choose from and, and a wide variety from something that might be in the $40 range to something that's in the $300 range. Just depends on what you're looking for. When you ream, I ream at the slowest speed that I can obtain. Now the second question will be is, can I do it by hand? Yeah, you can. Now I've done it by hand. I don't recommend it, but you can. So what will happen is, is that, for instance, let's see if this works in here. So in most cases, what it is is just this part of, this part of the hosel is, is what is tapered. Now in some cases that's not, the, the bottom, the, the top, the entryway is also smaller. Just depends on the manufacturer. However, if you can get it in here and you can really concentrate on, on holding it in there, you can do it. That's using a drill. I don't necessarily recommend it because the minute you slide, you bind it and then you get caught and that thing can fly out of your hand and people get hurt. Now there is a way you can mount this guy in a vise, put a, a holder or a unit on here, like a, a T-handle, 
and just do it by hand. Now, it, it, it's a concerted effort to do that, but it does work. Now, if you're doing it like that, I would suggest using cutting oil. That way it makes it a little easier to go through there. The reason why I don't use cutting oil is because I just don't want to go through the process of, you know, once you put the oil in, that's just a chemical in the way of the bonding. Well, yeah, Jim, clean it out. Yeah, I know. But the, when you put the paper towels in, it still leaves a film in there. So now what do you got to do? Well, I put acetone in there to clean it out, and I use more paper towels, and I more than wipe it out. Okay, so that gets all that out of there. Now you got acetone sitting in there. And acetone does evaporate, so if you're not in a hurry, that's the way to go. Me, it's like bam, 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 and it just, it just is in the way. Now, if I'm taking my time, and I, and I, or I've got time for that matter, then yeah, I put it in there, clean it out real good, let it set for a couple hours, maybe more, in order to ensure everything's evaporated. Maybe even hit it with a little bit of heat. And that way you can ensure it just evaporates, because I don't want any of that stuff, I don't want anything in there that's gonna cause a potential for the epoxy bond to not happen. Right, that's just what I'm looking for. I wanna make sure I have this, this epoxy bond that doesn't give. And sometimes that'll, that'll do it when you get a chemical lubricant or something like that that's in there. So that's the reason why we ream. Now, there's, like I told you before on size is also important. Yes, I know it is. But the, the 370 is, uh, is normally the tip size. And, and do they make a tape? The funny part is, do they make a tapered reamer? Yeah, they do. <laughs> why, do why would you need it? I don't know. But hey, they, they do make it. So there, that's reaming to, to put that in there. Now it's frequency, right? We're going to make this to a particular flex for this golfer in Quebec. And if the man has sent me, a, he sent me the graphs, I know that's going to be important. So that's what we're going to concentrate on next. He's labeled the shafts for me already in, in alphabetical lettering. And, and I did weigh them. And sure enough, he's got them from lightest to heaviest and how we're going to do that. So he's got it going on. I just think he probably needed my help in reaming and stuff. So we're going to go to the bench. What I'm going to do is show you a, how you find the frequency on the first one, and then we just go from there. So let me move you around. All right, so how, here's how we start. I have two, four, six. I actually have eight shafts. I have two, four, six, seven heads. Now I've done all the weighing. And in order to get them correct, that this shaft was out of whack. Now all these were 125 to 126, which is a really, really, really good spread. Now because they're S300s, you're allowed a three to five gram, I believe, is the is the number of weight variants you can have between the shafts. It's when you get to the other numbers that it gets smaller. Well, this guy here was 130. And that so in order for this set to be the best it can be, we're going to use these and leave this as an outlier just in case. Alrighty, so in order to make this happen, take my fishing line. And we're going to start at the top. And so there are specific trim codes for specific shafts. Those have existed since time began. And some are a half inch, some are, some are not. So you see this right here? This is gonna throw some, if you're really, really being precise, that's gonna throw this off. Give me a minute. All right, now we're a little more clean, so it's a little closer to the head weight. It's just a thing, was it? It was probably a 10th of a gram, but now at least it looks better. All righty, so he said he's got these things uh, pured, and there's the line on them. So we're either going to figure out it goes this way or it goes 90 degrees. We'll find that out here in a second. From his notes, which are right here, he wants a 39-inch forearm, which is a half an inch over. We got that set. Turn on our machine. And let's mark 39. Now this is a an uncut shaft, so typically it's between either a two or a three iron that this is good for. And we're gonna just see what we're starting with. You gotta know what you got in order to understand where you gotta go. So I got 283, 
283 for me is too low. So we want to go one, two, three, three cuts before we do this. So now we know we need to cut it at least an inch and a half. So that would mean that if you had it at one half inch increments, if you start at the two, be three, four, five, and there you are. So we're in pretty good shape. Now we saw how it was moving, which mean in all it, all reality it wasn't. Let's see. There we go. Yeah, so we got a wobbler. So that must mean that this thing goes 90 degrees. So let's do this. There we go. Very close. All right, so you see just a little bit of wobble there. And that's the whole idea of puring. This thing is going to give you a good idea where you need to go, but you still need to do this particular part to make sure you're correct. Okay, so we've got that. Now we got to cut it. Now that we know where it's got to go, that was just a that was just a test to see what we need to do. So let's sneak up on this thing. We only cut an inch off just to make sure. Put my earplugs in. We only cut an inch off first. That way we don't overdo it. So whenever you go to trimming, you know, you can always have a, uh, a burr or something and you want to make sure you take those off because it could impact the fit or even cut this line if you're using line. So that's what we do. All right, let's put that line towards the target. Back to 39. And let's see what we get. Okay, it's still a little soft. I have to go a little bit more. All right, so we have to do a little bit of difference. This is the reason why we look at this two or three times, is that his slope his slope, there's the R, there's the S, and it goes that way. And so he's looking at it from a, this is a uh, golf works type chart where mine's the opposite. So we're in between the R and the S. So doing that. <laughs> nice. So the R and S for me, by taking off that inch, put me about right where he wanted to be in the upper end of the R flex because the way they've got it is it's in a range and it says that he has a slower more controlled swing when he hits his irons so this is going to work out pretty good but I tell you what he gets really really aggressive when he gets into his driver <laughs> so let's go with that that fits the trim code actually pretty good. So the peering line was towards the target. We're going to make a line on the back of the head and on the back of the shaft so we know how to align it properly. We got that, now let's move on. Now here's the reason why we do all the measuring and do every, put everything the way it is, because the, the DGs or the Dynamic Golds have a one half inch trimming code. And so now that we found out what our bottom our base is, then we just go to another half inch above it. Okay, so now I've got my base frequency number that I need to go off of, and everything is about four and a half to five from that. Okay. 
Let's see how this works out. I have to go a little bit more. Yeah, I have to go just a little bit more. And this is how, the reason why we do this frequency matching the way we do, to make sure that it's there. I think we're really close with this too. Yep. I like that. Alrighty, so we're gonna, I need to come up at least another two CPM. So I'm gonna nibble this off to go from this. Yep, just a few more. Alright, got it facing the right way. And I only needed a couple of CPMs in order to make this go correct, so I only nibbled it off just a little bit. Okay. That's what we were looking for. Of course, now I don't have it in the right spot. <laughs> there we go. There it is. All right. Make that mark and away we go. So frequency matching in a nutshell. You know, you gotta start off with your base. You gotta figure out where you're at so you know where you gotta go as far as trimming goes. Now, here's the key. When somebody sends you this, somebody sends you that, this does not match that. All right, this is different than this. The, you know, the, the Golf Works, the, the Golf Works uh, frequency machine, although very excellent, and I've had one for many, many, many years, when I switched to this one, I created a new chart. So that is calibrated to this. So this is my frequency chart. That's somebody else's. So you have to, and when I did this, it kind of, when I used their numbers, it put them into the S flex range, or the S flex range, which I thought I was looking at, but he had his sticker on him, and I could have sworn it was an S300. However, these say R300s on them. So that's a bit of a different thing. And that's a heck of a lot of trimming to get to an S and we're, no. But if you look at his, if you look at his chart, see the R and the S and he's in between. So you got to kind of look more at the, more at the flex that they're looking for and then apply your own frequencies because the machines will read differently. So when I did mine like that, the trim codes actually worked out very, very well. And I got him into the portion of the R flex range where he was at on my chart to make the flexes move. Now the numbers don't look the same, but the flexes are the same. Hopefully that makes sense because flex is a measurement of the CPMs versus the length, not just some bin number. All right, <laughs> I hope I really made that difficult. So once you get to base, you can use the standard trim codes and what you do is I just nibble off just a little bit less just to see where we're at because, again, all the shafts are different. I know they're made in very much the same way and their tolerances are should be tighter. Well, I can hear better now. They should be tighter. However, you just never know. And, and why risk it? So nibble off just a little bit, check with what you got, and then bring yourself up to it and there's your base. Then you go a half inch more, cut it, check it. And as you saw, we had to nibble off a little bit more than what we thought. Then on the other one, we nibbled off, or we took off the same amount as the trim codes would say, and that one came out just fine. So you gotta keep, that's where you gotta be, right? You gotta keep checking that, and that's how you do them individually. Now, it depends on your tolerances too. If your tolerance is a, oh, I don't know, quarter of a flex to a half a flex, then just trim code it up, and you'll probably be there every time. Mine's a little tighter, right? I, I tried to get within a 
Oh, within a couple of CPMs of the flex. That's the reason why I do them individually like this. So there you go. And there, and that's, that is frequency matching in a nutshell. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put these together as the, uh, you know, as he's got, cause we're going to put in, he's got some gold ferrules. That's going to look pretty cool. Honestly, we're going to put some gold ferrules on there. Then we'll talk about what it looks like when we put the drivers together. So let me put these together first. We'll come back and talk about the driver. Whew. Well, I got done shoveling snow while I was waiting on the clubs to dry and finding boxes to make this shipment. And I think we've got it all done. So the uh, original T100s, right? The original T100s, they came out very, very well. I like how they turned out. Swing weights across the board were all the same. Now the golfer wanted them to go from like a D1 to a D3. Uh, or D2, but they're all going to be D3. Now, why D3? Well, we're a half inch long. I put two extra wraps on this guy. No weight on the inside. It's just purely the weight of all this putting together. But because of the wing and the consistencies that Titleist had and the dynamic golds were, that it came out a very nice even D3 plus or minus maybe a quarter. So not too bad. I really like the way they came out. Now we did the frequency matching and all the frequencies right there. So it did very, very well right here. I really like this. The tacky mat grip uh, is kind of a surprise, we'll say. It's a made in the USA grip and it has the, you know, it has the tour velvet like texture, uh, but it's very, very sticky, i.e. tacky mac. Okay. Now what we, a few changes from the original part of the build. <clears throat> Uh, the, the golfer from Quebec handed me a, uh, a feral for this that did not match. And as we've talked about these, just like in PXGs, they have a really deep, very wide centering feral type thing. And it wouldn't have fit very well. So I put, I put one that fit on there and it makes the club look really, really good. And again, it is in line with the rest of the irons and it should be very, very well. Now, this golfer owns a true blue. And uh, so he's going to be able to do his own loft and lies. All right, another con another change that I made was to his hybrid. All right, the hybrid came out very, very nice as far as uh, the length, right? The length came out the way he wanted. The swing weight, I believe, is just a hair, is a, a, no, it's actually heavier. Uh, it's heavier, and that has to do with the shaft and the way that it's profiled. However, he also sent me another Another ferrule that was really long. It would have been way out here. So I, I went and dug one out and I went and actually looked at a picture of an original one to see just how long it really was, right? And it wasn't very. So I dug out one that was appropriate and so it, it makes it look a little nicer. Same thing with the TaylorMade. The TaylorMade one uses a shorter one. He provided a little bit longer one. I left that one go only because there was a, a, a nick on the shaft and it covered the nick. So cosmetically, it just looks better, okay? Last but not least is the driver. The ping driver is the max. He had it on his uh, setting where he wanted it to be and, uh, and, and just where he wanted it. And we put the hazardous in there. Should be good to go. Now this one came out, I had to, I had to add some weight to this one to get to the swing weight that he wanted. And that's fine because it was a very, very stiff shaft and that little extra weight brought it down just ever so slightly. And what I did is took an eight gram and I just kept trimming it down until I got what I needed from it. And that actually was the only club I actually had, well, that's a fib. That and the ping iron were the only two clubs I actually added weight to for a swing weight issue. So that's, they turned out good. That's the part I like about it. So we're putting them in boxes, we're contacting this golfer in Quebec, and, and hopefully he enjoys them, and I think they turned out very, very nice. So, if you got any questions, put them in the show notes. Don't forget to like and subscribe, join us on our, U our YouTube live stream on Mondays at 17.30 Eastern or 5.30 PM, 5 p.m. Eastern, and we'll just talk about it. It goes around the world. We talked, well, in fact, to this fellow here in Canada, We've talked to him, and we've talked to people all over. It's just a really casual atmosphere on things that you would want to do for that. All right, Martel, thank you for the support. Thank you for supporting McGolf. And as always, guys, 
let's see your scores go low.